basically what Nola's asked me to do is talk to you about staying healthy during the Moravian Music Festival when you would be singing a long time. And that if you're not going to the Moravian Music Festival, you can apply this to anything that you're doing if you have a long uh, period of time that you're going to be singing. Um, with my students uh, at the School of the Arts, uh, I give them the first day they walk in the door, walk in the studio, I tell them this, this story. Um, and it's, uh, it's, I ask them if they uh, maybe attend church. And many of them do. And I ask them if they've ever been to a children's service. And they all say, yes, we've been to a children's service. The children come down to the front, and the minister will tell a story, and he'll always ask a question. And the answer to the question is always what? Jesus. Jesus. No matter what question you ask, <laughs> the answer is always Jesus. And so I say it's the same thing with vocal technique. It's if anyone asks you a question about vocal technique, the answer is breath. The answer is breathing. So uh, if you can learn how to breathe correctly, that's going to be something that's going to keep you vocally healthy. Um, there's something that's going on now. And now, now that I tell you about this, you're going to recognize this. And you're going to see this everywhere now. There is something called a vocal fry. Does anybody know what a vocal fry is? What's a vocal fry? Yes. That's a bass vocal fry. But you have. Britney Spears, who talks like that, you know, it's like, you know, California, talk like that. And um, I think it's probably from, it's probably from microphones. And it's because you don't have to move your breath when you're singing into a microphone. So they sing like this, closed throat, no breath. So that Vocal fry is a horrible thing for your, for your uh, singing. So if you want to wear your voice down really fast, have a vocal fry. A vocal fry. So um, it's, it's a real uh, ec epidemic right now, with especially young girls. I see girls come into the studio with that problem. And it's because they're not moving their air when they speak. So if you ever get a chance to see Margaret Thatcher speak, she takes a breath, and she speaks on her breath. So when you're speaking, have a sense of using uh, your language on your breath. So taking a breath and then speaking and speaking and keeping your breath moving when you speak. So speaking correctly, uh, is something that's going to keep your voice from becoming tired as well. So, um, so do you know the, the physiology of your vocal folds or your voice? Does any, everybody we have, okay, we have vocal folds that are, um, or there are vocal cords. The vocal cords are, they're twin folds that are horizontal and they're stretch across the larynx. Here, and the larynx is this part right there. And that's basically how, where your sound is produced. And that's air being pushed through those cords that come together and vibrate. And if you don't have air going through there, then they're going to become raw. They'll become raw. And um, so that's how we phonate, by pushing air through those vocal folds. That, so. Make sure that you always breathe when you speak. So um, there's a couple of exercises that I give my chorus to think about how to use your breath to. So um, let's all stand up. And you've probably done these before. And if you're in my chorus, you've done those. So when you breathe, uh, if you ask most people to breathe, they will breathe high this way. But if you, tonight, when you're lying in bed, lay on your back and take a breath, big, deep breath, and you'll see that your shoulders don't move. Your stomach will rise, but your shoulders will not move. So that tells me that's, that's a very comfortable and relaxed way to breathe. So we should breathe down. People say from their, your diaphragm. 
which is not really physiologically correct. But what you're doing is you're relaxing and releasing all your muscles down here, including your back, especially your back. So when you breathe, you can put one hand here and you can put one hand on your back, okay? And take a breath and see if you can just let everything release. Your back and your tummy release, take a breath. And breathe out like this. So pull it in. At the same time, make sure you relax up here. Big breath. Good. It's good. One more breath. So breathing down from down there is a really relaxed way to breathe. Uh, it takes care of tension up here, if you can really be aware of tension up here. Breathe low, relaxed. So another exercise just to work this is this one. Breathe again and you can see it pulsate. Good. Send breath. Good. So that's the way Margaret Thatcher, you can sit down. That's the way Margaret Thatcher speaks, is from her diaphragm. She breathes and she says, my dear fellow, so you want to speak like a Shakespearean actor. And when you, if you ever have listened to opera singers interviewed, they all speak like that, kind of very healthy, very open, never like that. So make sure that your breath is moving. This is just a vocal technique workshop as well. One way to stay in shape during a, a period when you're singing for long periods of time is to actually be in shape. I tell my students too that uh, your vocal mechanism and singers are very much like that of an athlete. So you have to stay in shape. If you ask a runner to just run you know, cold, they're going to injure themselves. And you're going to injure yourself if you sing too long and haven't been singing for a while. So now how many of you are active? Obviously, you're here because you're active singers and choirs. Is that right, correct? So your uh, music director will warm you up before uh, rehearsal in order to make sure that you're not damaging yourself. So warming up is a very important thing to do. And also, practicing is a very important thing to do before you go and sing for a long period of time. So um, how many are going to the Moravian Music? Uh, OK, for those who are going to do this, and those of you who want to stay in vocal shape, um, have a set of exercises. And I'll give you some today that will keep you in shape to sing. And honestly, it doesn't take a lot. It takes consistent singing. So uh, the optimal <coughs> practice for me, for singers to stay in shape, is to sing multiple times a day for a short period of time. So if you get a chance to do it, everybody's busy. But you can sing. Um, when you get a first chance in the morning, if that's possible, sing scales, get your voice warmed up for 15 minutes, then stop. You don't have to sing any more than that. And then later in the day, sometime, do the same thing and stop. <coughs> Maybe do that three times a day. And that will really keep your voice in shape. It's an important thing to build up your stamina in order to have good health. Uh, vocal health as well, and to maintain stamina and just being in shape like an athlete. Um, let's see, I'll look at my notes here. So I'll give you some, um, some exercises for you to do too, and you don't need to stand up to do that. There's one, there's exercises that you want to do at the beginning of warming up that um, will, will be gentle on your vocal cords. And one of my favorite ones are lip trills. Has anybody ever done lip trills? Uh, no? Yes. Yeah, that's it. That's it. It's just, it's just like. And you can do it in a fifth. So I go. That 
the same time, breathe. Now, do this well, because it's going to be on YouTube. Okay? This well, and... Uh, like that, you can do that, yeah. You can't, right? It it uh, and it and and it, it's very gentle on your voice too, because it's hard to over sing. Doing, <laughs> you can't do it, but you do have to breathe. Yeah, do you have to breathe? Yes. So what about the velocity of the air? Do you get rid of all of it when you're doing your? That is a very good question. Yes, you should, but sometimes, um, it's sometimes it's not all gone. That's exactly right. So don't take a breath when you go up a half step. Take it until you run out of breath. So it's a half, that's a very good question. So, Beth, so, it's, so it would be like this. And then think. Besides breath. <laughs> The most important thing, maybe not even besides, but definitely the most important thing in singing is your brain. <laughs> it, really, it's your brain. So if you're if you're thinking about and you have um, you have some technique, some things that you can pull out of your bag and and apply to your voice, think about them. <laughs> so what I what I do with my students, I have to tell them to think, to breathe after this exercise. So they do these five, these lip trills. <laughs> then they take a breath, they don't think about your breath. So apply, apply that breath thing with the, with the lip trill as well. So take the time to take the breath. So let's try that. Let's try everybody do three lip trills. We'll do um, up by half a step, and then just take a second, relax your jaw, and take a breath. Okay, let's try it. Now think, breathe. Good, yeah, you can do that for five minutes, and that's something to get to sing in the shower. Yes. Some people can't do it. Some people cannot do it. It's true. Um, uh, you can, or you can do it in another way, too. Put, put your uh, fingers right here. Now try it. Can you do it that way? OK, let's who can't, who can't do it? Who can't do it? Try, try putting your okay. There, you did it. Good. Yeah, so that helps, too. <laughs> Yes. Um, my mother received voice training. Here's a quick question. My mother received voice training about 19 years ago. She would open up every morning practice at the piano, blah, 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 blah. Now that has the, does that do the same effect? Um, it doesn't, but it's a good exercise. It's a good exercise. That's, this one you're doing right now is what I would recommend that you do first thing. The blah, 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 blah. That's a little bit more um, on your chords. So you're not quite ready to go yet. That's, it's, unless you are really in shape. So your mother may have been the type of person that can jump out of bed and sing right away. I'm th that way. It doesn't take me long. I know, it's terrible. <laughs> Sorry, but I know, I know. But I mean, I really, it does, it takes me two minutes to warm up. But I am unusual in that way. That doesn't say anything about the quality of your voice. Because I know singers who it takes a half an hour at least to warm up, an hour to warm up, and they're fantastic singers. But it just, so that's, that's, a, that's a good point, is that everybody's got their own way of warming up, and the amount of time it takes for people to warm up varies a lot. I have, some uh, singers who cannot sing at all before noon, <laughs> right? Yes. Ready to try that. Um, <laughs> what what would you define as constituting readiness? What, what is that little step that you say when I can Good do question. this? I am warmed up. Well, I think it's, uh, I think it's 
um, being aware of what your range is and being able to sing through your entire range. So for me, what I do is I sing a, 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 a nine scale, and when I know I can sing a nine scale up to but an A flat, I do, ah, I'm ready. I know, I can go a little higher. Ah, I'm ready. I can sing. So I know I can do that, I can sing. If I can't do that, <laughs> if I, I, I know I can do that. But I think, I think um, this, I, there are really wonderful basic exercises that you can do, uh, but you have to craft them for yourself. So I'm, so I'm going to give you a couple of them. Lip trills really good across the board for everybody and do them first. Um, but what you have to decide for yourself when you feel like you're ready, but I think it's when you feel like you're in your range, you can sing a scale. I had one that tells something. I had one colleague who had one piece that he sang all the time, and he knew if he could sing that piece, he was warmed up. It was a, there's a wonderful collection of Italian, early Italian songs, 24 Italian songs at Ari's it's called. We call it 24 Italian Hits. They sang Nina. Tre giorni son che Nina, che Nina, che Nina. He knew he, if he had that, that was it. He was warmed up. So you could find a piece that you sing that would give you that information too. So let me give you a couple more exercises. And here's a variation of a lip trill. And this one um, is really good for when you're tired. When you're tired, you've been singing for a long time, and you know you have to get up and sing again. And this is, I call it the kazoo. And it's the same thing. Is it every time you kazoo? So you so almost imitate the sound of kazoo. <laughs> Let's try this. <laughs> good one when you wake up in the morning and you know you have to sing and you're tired. That's a good one. Yes, Bob. It seems like both these exercises are substituting the compressed lips or the tongue against the roof of the mouth uh -huh. for resistance to the breath instead of the vocal cords. No, the, the, the vocal cords are vibrating. vibrating. Yeah, because your air is passing through it. Yeah. Air is passing through it, but it's much gentler and there's no... You, you don't have to deal with vowels. You don't have to be, deal with glottal stops. Um, it's very gentle. But it's the same mechanism. Now, humming is a little different. So when you do lip trills, you're expelling air out your mouth as well. So it's the same kind of thing. But, the, but first exercise, it's a very good one. Um, so you know, how many of you have sung uh, maybe really hard one night and woken up the next morning and your throat is tired, right? Throat is tired. Um, when that happens, you must be careful. That's when you should really be careful about warming up and singing hard for that day. Then you should maybe take the day off. If you wake up the next morning, if you have to sing that next night, then gentle exercises are okay. Um, or if you're in a rehearsal, you have to go into a rehearsal, there's something that is called marking. Do you know what marking is, everybody? It's, a, it's a, actually used for dancers as well. So if dancers are doing something, instead of actually doing the pirouette, they just pretend to do the pirouette. And for us, marking is singing half voice, or when you're going high, you can sing down the octave. So it's, it's singing, and it's singing with some diction, but singing lower uh, when it gets just a little bit higher, and um, definitely not singing with your voice. And many conductors, uh, choral conductors, are very sympathetic to all of that. If you tell them, I'm going to participate, and articulate, and do all my 
consonances and my pure vowels, but I'm, I'm going to mark because I'm vocally tired. They're going to go great. Save your voice for the performance. So um, be careful if you wake up the next day after being very tired and your chords are still really tired. Don't try to force it. Oftentimes, though, what will happen is you'll sing very hard. The next morning, you'll get up, and you're fine. You're fine. Sometimes it happens because you're not quite in shape that you're tired the next day. But um, you have to have an, that kind of awareness. There are ways to sing and participate in uh, rehearsals and concerts without stressing your voice out. Absolutely a way to do it. Um, so let's, let me give you a couple other exercises to warm up. I would um, really recommend doing trills first. And that's definitely something you can do. Um, all of these are something you can do in the shower. Um, you should have a sense of what uh, range is good for you to start on. When I start, I start on an E all the time. That's where I start. So find out. You probably all have some keyboard or piano. Go find out where you know, it's very comfortable for you to start. And start there and go up half steps on those fifths until it feels comfortable. And then go back down again. That's all you really need to do. It doesn't need to be pushed at all. Um, then uh, another exercise that I think is quite good is one that's good for, um, we'll start a little lower for everybody, is if we do this in my choir, is <clears throat> it's a consonant and vo vowel uh, exercise, very simple, three notes. So it's mi, ma, and you want to voice the consonant. Mi, ma. Let's give it a try. Mi, as well with different consonances and different vowels. Mm. Oftentimes, the higher we get, especially men, E vowel is not the greatest vowel in the world. It spreads out this way. So you can change the vowel. Go to an A vowel or an A vowel. Um, and do that until it gets comfortable. Stretch it out a little bit and then go back down. And then there's all of the, uh, what what uh, Tom was talking about is ba 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 ba, or did she do? What did she do? Blah, blah blah blah. Yeah, actually, blah 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 is a pretty good one <laughs> because blah blah blah. Yes, because it's very blah blah blah. It's very gentle here. So that's an arpeggio. You could do arpeggios, or you could do fives, and I would suggest doing fives, which are you've all done that. Um, that's good. And then up half steps. Changing vowels too. And just, it's like pizza dough. You stretch it out and you stretch it out. You have to keep stretching it out. If you've worked with pizza dough, sometimes it goes back this way. We have to stretch it out until everything's relaxed. And that is the important part of vocal warm ups, is making sure that you take your time to stretch it out. Now, you probably have had um, experiences, too, where you do get up in the morning and you can't sing. But if you warm up and then check your voice later in the afternoon, it's better. And if you warm up a little bit more, by the time you get to a rehearsal in the evening, you're going to be fine. Your voice is going to be there. Who's had that experience? Probably everybody. Yeah. Um, other things to really take into account are things that you already know about vocal health, I think. But they've been uh, repeating um, sleep. So I know that if I don't get any sleep, I have a hard time singing. So sleep, 
drinking uh, water, although not too much water, because you can give yourself reflux, and reflux is very, very bad for your vocal cords. So uh, I'm, you, I'm sure you all know what that is. It's the acid coming up and splashing against your cords, your vocal folds, and which is not good. Over singing is not a good thing. So if you, you can have a sense of if you're over singing, and I know, I'm sure you've had this experience too. You're singing in a chorus and you're just singing and it just won't come out, you're tired. The best thing to do is stop. Don't try to push it. And actually just a few minutes of silence is going to help you rest as well. So those, those, are, the, those are the things that really I would recommend doing. And these, let's just go over that again. It's make sure that you use your breath when you speak and have a sense of it. And all of this has to do with just having a sense of uh, what your body is doing, a real physical awareness. Uh, make sure that you use your breath when you're singing and you're speaking. And don't breathe from here. Relax. Because if you breathe from here, you're tight. Being tight and singing don't go together. Loose singing is the best. Relaxed, loose, open singing is the best. So breathing from here, and making sure that this mechanism is relaxed. Um, making sure that you stay in shape and that you do exercises that um, will get your voice warmed up in a methodical way. So no singing high notes right away first thing in the morning, warm it up a little bit. So you have the lip trills, you have the kazoo thing if you're very tired, you have the three note thing on ma, me, or mi, ma, and it's vo using consonants. So consonants, to other consonants this can work. Z, z, I like using a consonant because you could voice it, me, ma, and it gives some nice thrust out here, so it's not back here. Um, then fives, this. Just have my half steps up there, and stretch your voice out. Those are, those are probably enough for you to do before you go to a rehearsal. And then when you work with a conductor, you're going to be able to do what they ask you to do. Making sure that you uh, get enough rest and you're healthy and that you drink plenty of water. Also, you probably know this too with reflux. It depends on what you eat. So, you know, don't overeat Thai food or whatever, spicy food, Mexican food, something. If you, unless you can take it. But you probably all know what causes that on your own. Reflux is very bad for your throat. Yes? I have two things that you haven't mentioned. And most okay. of us, I think, are in my age. Too many more. Age. When you get older, mm -hmm. um, for women anyway, in my case, after you're 50, you begin to realize you're not breathing. Even when you're just, I mean, you're breathing, but it's very shallow breathing. It kind of goes with old age. Aging and also uh, your vocal folds change, mm -hmm. and your so that changes range, and mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to determine what will work, especially if you've had like, yeah. any other mm -hmm. um, like I have allergies, so they affect things too. But the breathing, I found yoga is amazing for teaching me how to breathe mm -hmm. deeply, and I wish I had known that when I was younger and I had asked. Well. It's when I uh, interviewed for the job at Home Church, the music position job, someone asked me about um, addressing aging issues because we do have older folk in the choir, and I think it's a there is very little done research done on that. There, it's starting to be done, but it's I think it's an important thing to think about. I think what we were talking about breathing can just you know work for your whole life. Um, I think the way that singers breathe when they breathe correctly 
is just very healthy and it's very much like yoga. It's breathing down into your lower chakras, you know? It's breathing low into your womb. It's breathing all the way around here and having a relaxed breath. So ultimately, that's a very important thing to do. Do you think that um, it gets more difficult to breathe as you're getting older? Yeah, is that what they? Personally. Does anybody else have that experience? That's funny. Uh huh. That's full breathing. Sometimes you have to really relax your whole body. Just Does it have to do with that's tension? Why it helps. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. And it's all about breathing and stretching. And at the beginning, I find it really hard to take those long, slow breaths. By the end of it, I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. Also, reaching up high like this when you breathe mm -hmm. it really frees up the space. Mm -hmm. That's one of the first things we do in our choirs. Have you stretch this way, and then put your arms down and make sure that you're in a good position to breathe. Uh, but I, I do think, yes, I do think um, that practice and, and uh, attention, as I was saying, using your, you know, making sure you have an awareness of your breath is so important. And I, it can be so good for you as you age, I think. Um, I spend so much time Beth, talking to my students about releasing tension. And where I'm starting from, I mean, it's a whole, you know, <laughs> it's a very long process. But now, do you all feel tension here when you sing? On your shoulders? Does anybody? If you don't, that's really good. But oftentimes, you know, you'll see people trying, trying to sing from here. Not good. It's the breath. Relaxing with the breath. Now, as, as you were saying, as you age, your vocal folds will become less uh, responsive. And that's really what I think what you're talking about there. You, sometimes you see a vibrato coming in. Uh, and vibrato, the vibrato is, is nothing that is something you can manipulate. You cannot manipulate. If you try to manipulate vibrato, you're in trouble. The only way to deal with vibrato is to align your body and your breath in a correct way. And that is making sure that you do have a good breath and that your flow of breath is nice and forward against your mask. That's why this exercise, keeps your, your, your breath moving forward and not on your chords. Singing through a consonant will keep, keep it forward. And that, that'll help. That'll help sort of tighten up your vibrato a little bit. But there's, there's not much that one can do about that. It's, it's going to happen. You know, it's going to happen. And, and every but my father could sing um, you know, with a young voice until he was in his 70s, and you know, people like that, too. And I fully expect to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but some people don't. And, and I, honestly, women's voices uh, age quicker. Depends, though. I mean, you have someone like Leontine Price who could sing like a goddess when she was 70. But it depends on the individual. You're going to say something? How, um, how do you shift from your speaking voice to your singing voice? Well, I you don't. Know, you, know, <laughs> you sing all day long. You've got your head in yeah. your You've got your speaking voice in your singing position all the time. But the rest of us mortals don't. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a good question. Always use your breath. I mean, it's, it's, I'm being redundant about this. But I do have, actually, I have my students make them when they're uh, learning a piece to speak it like they're Shakespearean actors so they can keep on their breath. So I don't speak like that all the time. But I do speak on my breath. So I'm very conscious of keeping this open. And, and moving my breath when I'm speaking, taking a breath and moving my breath all the time. So I, it's really about moving your breath. Does that make sense? So it's not, so you're not talking like this, darling. You just release it. 
Release it and keep speaking. I think there is, I think uh, uh, microphones really have had a detrimental effect on vocal health for that reason. Because we don't need to uh, project at all when we're doing public speaking. Everybody's got, can be really come down low. And so we just don't, there's no elocution anymore. When you learn elocution, you were learning how to form your vowels and you were learning to stay on your breath. So I think it's, I think speaking does wear you down. I mean, does anybody do that for a living? Like speak all day for a living or have to and at the end of the day you're tired? So you have to really make sure that you're on your breath. And how do you feel about excessive laughter on the course? Depends on how you laugh, I think. Okay. Yeah. It kills me. Yes. Ah. Yeah. Well, I, someone asked me to me that they couldn't come to this, and they, I said, well, I'll give you the quick version. Don't go to a baseball game or a football game and scream at the top of your lungs, and you'll be fine. <laughs> so that, too, you know, I, I think that is true. No, you know, don't, don't excessively uh, use your cords. Yeah. Okay, now when you sing, yeah, no, take, try, try it, say, yes, take a big breath and then speak. Try it. Okay, then take a breath. Yeah, but, you know, I know you're conscious of that. You're conscious, I mean, you're self-conscious of having to take a breath, but no one else is. When you're speaking and you have to take a breath in the middle of a phrase, that's Okay. You can do it, no one's gonna notice it, but you're gonna notice it. I think if you have an awareness, it's a technique. Yeah. It's a vocal technique, and no one's gonna notice that you're doing that, but you should. Yeah, I, I, it's very easy to keep your breath moving. I've, I've had students with serious problems with that. They thought like this, well, well, I don't know, Mr. Zeter, I don't know. I said, oh, move your breath. And I have to, well, I have to say it, you know, for six months. And then finally after six months, they got it. You know, now they don't, I don't even notice they do it anymore. I have one student like that right now. And it's kind of a trendy way that young people do this. They do it, I, I thought it came from movies and myself, from some actress who did yeah. it once, and, and there's a cool way to talk. And I hear it a lot. Well, we were just, we were talking about this at the beginning, that that's, that vocal fry is, uh, that's a, listen to Britney Spears talk, she talked like that. Right. You know, there's, there's been, a, there's been quite a bit written about this phenomena, and it's, it's a very, it's fairly recent phenomena. So, we need to nip that in the bud. I noticed it among female broadcasters. Yes. It, for some reason, it happens more with women than men. But I, I notice it too, absolutely, with female broadcasters, and it's just, it's, n it's not necessary. It's an easy thing to do. Yeah, Bob? I think in the culture, uh, a lot of articulation is just going by the board. Yeah. For example, our generation, most of the people in this room are asked to remember a past president and say Clinton. When people today, Clinton. young people say Clinton, yes. they drop the C. They don't pronounce the tussle interior Right. No, that, there's a lot of that going on. Well, we hear a lot of things that are broken. You know, right. It's broken. Shortened. Broken. You know, I did it. Right. The, the contractions all seem to be. Right. I'd, be, I, I'd hate to be a, a, a non-English speaker coming here and trying to understand <laughs> someone, because everything kind of goes together. Yeah, Tom. Some of that's regional. I wonder if I can give yes. you one quick message from my mother. Who lived to 95 or so and had breathing problems, lung problems uh, all her life, really. And she attributes her survival of old age basically to that, you know, that, that vocal practicing she did uh, up until the last two or three years of her life. And do you think it was because of breath? Or? Well, I, don't, I can't read that, but the point is it was exercising her lungs and it was good therapy for her. Right. No. So whether you sing or perform or anything like that, it's, your exercises are life giving. I absolutely agree with that. But you have to have a you do have to have an awareness of it. And your mother had a technique that she did every day that worked for her. 
And that's, the, that's what I would suggest that you do, is just play around with some of these ideas. And there's, um, it doesn't have to be difficult. And I, I don't think it needs to be um, broken down into minutia. It doesn't have to be a trick. It can be some very simple exercises that you do to stay in shape and find something that works for you to stay in shape. Um, that's what I recommend, and it works. But breathing, the most important thing. Again, it's that comes back to Jesus. Um, the right answer to the question <laughs> is always breath. Any other questions? Mm-hmm. Yes, that's a good good question. Um, especially when you have to sing a long phrase, and you don't think you have enough time to take a breath, and they have to come in right away and sing another long phrase. My my answer to that is there's always enough time to take a breath. Always enough time, and here's the technique that you use is that when you get to the end of the phrase, you can't panic. Because if you tighten up, you will be unable to take a, a breath. And then the next phrase, so if you sing, ah, <laughs> ah, it's, you don't have time. <laughs> that hurt. <laughs> <laughs> so what you have to do is you have to do, Ah, I'm relaxed, I'm going to really relax, I'm really relaxed, okay, and then I'm going to breathe from down here. Ah, you take it very quickly, but you have to be really relaxed. But you have to, you have to, your mind has to be sharp, and you can do the physical action. You can do that physical action very quickly, and your brain can work that fast, and your body can work that fast. Does that answer your question? Okay. How do you feel about the school of thought that says don't stop? Don't stop to breathe, but breathe to stop. Show me what you mean. I'm not quite sure I know what I mean. Well, you, you just demonstrated it in effect. Don't stop to breathe, just breathe. It's not. You ah, don't right. Stop singing and then breathe. Right. You are singing and then you then are breathing. That, that's right. That, that's a really good way of thinking about it, I think, now that, that, that you just keep singing until you take a breath. <laughs> you're not anticipating it, and so you're not tightening it up. This is basically the same thing you're talking about. It's one, one whole cloth. All right. Well, there's a lot of vocal technique out there. There's a lot, lot to learn, but I think uh, the fundamentals are where you need to go. Basics. If you have a few things that are basic, then you can play around with them yourselves in a lot of ways. There's a lot on the internet, there's a lot written about it, and if you want to do that, you can take a look at vocal technique on the internet. You can read things about it, but um, basic technique that is modified to what you do is the way to go. So you know that breathing is right. Screaming is bad. Making sure that your vowels are pure. That's another thing. So we're, this is starting to turn into a little vocal pedagogy class, which is good for me. So pure vowels, too, especially with a choir. Um, just a, a, e, o, u. The Italians sing so well because their vowels are so pure. And we have to sing that way, too. It has to do with your tongue position, too. So do people have tension in their tongue when they sing? Does anybody here notice tension in your tongue? That was one of the things that I've had an issue with, is that I'll be singing. Mm -hmm. and won't even be conscious of it, but then my tongue will start pulling back. And, yeah. You know, somebody will say, get your tongue back against your teeth. Yeah, you put it on the bottom of your teeth, back right. Back. Yeah, and partly that has to do with how you use your breath, because I, I believe that you're trying to grab onto your tongue and use it as support, and your support should be your breath. So, but uh, having a sense of what your tongue is doing when it's forming a vowel is important. Ah. You practice on ah a lot, a lot because that's the neutral uh, vowel. And your tongue position, the back of the tongue, is fairly high. Ah, e, the tongue position is pretty much the same, only e, the tongue raises a little bit more. 
She's saying, I. Your tongue and your mouth position should be the same. On O and O, the only thing that's going to change is your mouth position. Your tongue position should stay the same. So that's if you want to get into your tongue position, that's something. Singing vowels, I have my students do this too. Just saying ah. Just sing vowels and have a sense of what your tongue, where your tongue is, and making sure that the tip of your tongue is at the bottom of your teeth and doesn't pull back, and keep your breath flowing. Yeah, boy, I, I, I hear a lot of different vowels. Uh, yes? Yeah. Well, okay, well, oftentimes, in order to not hurt someone's feeling, I will direct, I will direct it to everyone, but it's really at a specific person. And we all know who that is, so, or we might know who that is, but no, it's no one in this room. Okay, but yes, no, it's, it's, yeah, it's not directed at you. <laughs> I get a lot of spread vowels. Yes? Two questions. Um, one, will other kinds of exercise, somebody mentioned yoga, like running, treadmill, whatever, help your endurance of your breath? And secondly, give us some coaching about how to cultivate resonance. Okay. Okay. It, that, that's, a, that's a great word. That's a, that's a, a four-year course. I think, um, but uh, exercise, you know, obviously it's good for you. It's not going to hurt you, unless you're um, ill. If you have a, a cold, you know, don't exercise if it's in your chest. If it's in your head, maybe okay, but don't exercise if it's in your chest. But everybody's, exercise to me is fine. If you're running outside, you might want to not run when you're in Minneapolis and it's 10 degrees below zero. Well, you've seen singers before, opera singers. They don't exercise. <laughs> but no, I mean, those, I mean I, it's good to be in good health. It's just, I would say, I encourage all of my singers to be in good health. And it, it, uh, it doesn't change it. I mean, whether you're thin or heavy doesn't really change your vocal um, quality very much. It depends on how you breathe when you sing, and how you align your body when you sing. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? So no, I mean, exercising is good. It, it, it it's, it's, um, can't hurt, can't hurt. And it'll help your, um, sometimes uh, heavy exercise, you have to be very careful how you breathe and just be aware of breathing correctly and correctly is low. I think yoga probably is the closest uh, uh, for singers on how to breathe correctly. The sort of very focused physical actions about breathing and body alignment. With resonance, um, the resonance is um, opening up and singing. Now most resonance should happen, imagine that behind your eyes there's a room there's a cave behind your eyes. You want to make sure that that's open and that everything is relaxed. So my teacher said, just feel like you're just a big giant tube like that, nice and open. So you're not disconnected. So you're not only singing from your head up or just your head, your neck down, that you're connected all the way up and down. And there, that gets rather complicated after a while. Because if I might tell you, make sure that you keep your mask open and you focus here, and then you'll get somebody that sings like this. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> that's wrong. <laughs> then, then you have to readjust that. You're, you, know, you don't want to sing nasally. That happens when you, you're opening up your nasal passages here a little bit too much and expelling air through your nasal passage, so that doesn't help your residents. But it's, it's making sure that Here's one trick question I ask my students is, where is your voice? And some of them will say, here. But if they heard this question before, they'll say, my whole body is my voice. 
And that's true because you have to breathe and you have to resonate from your chest and you have to resonate from your mask. And the, you know, people say sing in your head. Well, the only place you can really sing in your head is when you open up your, your sinus passages here and your sinus, sinus cavities to resonate those. Resonance too is pharyngeal space here. Oftentimes we feel that tighten up on us. That's when we press the bottom of our tongue down and it gets tight. So that has to stay nice and open. And one way to think about keeping that open is, so if you've ever had a hot piece of food in the back of your tongue, like, uh, okay, I'm open like that. <laughs> okay, now that's open. You don't want to sing like that, but you can, one of the reasons that you hear opera singers talk like that is because they're always open with their nice round pear-shaped tune because their pharyngeal space is nice and stretched open and they're on their breath. So I hope that answers a little bit of your questions. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, uh, Martha's question about the difference between singing and speaking voices. Yeah. Uh, we tend to speak usually further down. Uh-huh. Yeah. Sing, we bring it up forward to put it more out front. On your mask, yeah. This, Mask you part. Yes. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. We, well, when you your your vocal folds uh, produce sound when air is pressed through it or passed through it. So the idea of moving your breath when you sing is making sure that it's, that it's moving out this way. So when you speak, you can speak with your, you know, this image of making sure that the breath is going out that way. And by doing that, then you're automatically getting your voice forward. Uh, and Absolutely. What, to keep their voice forward? Because where they sing and where they speak, there's a bigger gap between them. Hmm. Would you say that's true? No. No. But no. About it, sometimes you have to think about it. Sometimes it's easier to, say, to call it down here, but if you think about it, you can keep it forward. You can keep it forward, but you know, actually, you can speak, you can speak lower in your, in your chest. Just so you don't, that's, this is a good thing too, is, and this has something to do with Thomas talking about too, is that with resonance is that if you only speak in your chest and don't keep your head open, then you're getting in trouble. But you can speak low and still have some head resonance, too. Or you can be, I had a, an Italian um, piano friend, his name was Pietro Di Maria. He was, uh, does anybody know that piano? It's a really fine pianist from Venice. And he always spoke like this. Hello, Glenn, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> I live in Venice and I speak like this. It's just, yeah, he sings like that. I should sing uh, Rossini. You know, so it's, he spoke like that all the time. <laughs> I don't think we could get away. If you lived in Italy, maybe you could, but I don't know. But I think that's, that's a good point. I think keep the breath moving. If you keep your breath moving, you're going to have some more forward resonance or just play around with, with how you speak. Um, in the privacy. Yeah, or forward. You can do it forward. But make sure that when you do that, that you don't disconnect from the rest of your body. So you're not only just singing up here, but you make sure that everything's open. And you can speak open, but forward. Right. You had a question? Why is it that you, you're talking about being in good shape and so forth? It seems that most of the celebrated yeah. Are not little diminutive pip, pipsqueak people. Well, quite large people. you know that, that's that's a fallacy. Go go on. Um, go look who's singing at the Met now in the next production, in uh, Rigoletto, right? You have Gianna Demera, which is this gorgeous, you know, greyhound looking, and then you have Piotr Bakchala, who is this very handsome. Polish dude, beautiful. I mean, and you know, I, I, I used to think that too. There are some. I mean, I think the thing is that nobody cares 
if you look awful, if your voice is the voice of God, it's fine. But actually, uh, you look back in you know, the old days, there were some beautiful opera singers. You had Lily Pons and um, Risa Stevens, Risa Stevens you know, and today. It's more visual today. I think it's just an excuse. It's an excuse. But, yeah. Um, you're on, you're singing at a festival. You're on the fourth piece of ten pieces that are going to be coming up. Mm -hmm. And you notice that as you're singing, you're, you're excited, that you feel yourself starting to tighten up because all of a sudden those notes have just gotten so much higher than you remember they were going to be. You're straining all of this here. How do you recover while you're in the midst of this concert? That's a good question. That's very hard. Yeah. And not I, wasted on the next six months. Yeah. I think that's, that's very hard. You're talking about in the midst of a concert. In the midst of a and is it, are you saying that you're, um, in your experience, you're, um, it's because you're anticipating it, that you're excited, or is it, is it you're tired? I think part of it is um, kind of a combination. You're, you're anticipating what's coming up as a soprano. Mm -hmm. I know that those notes are going to be up there. Uh, as an older soprano, I know that they're not as easy for me to get to mm -hmm. as they were 20 years ago. But then also I know that maybe my director is depending on me because my vocal ability is a little higher than the person next to me. Yeah. So then I feel the pressure of needing to carry the part that you're not right. supposed to do. But I mean, well. all of that combined, you know, as a director is looking over at you and he's going, Come on, let's know, hear it. I yeah. need more from this side. And then you put the burden on yourself. But I mean, all, it, it's kind of like a, a tumbling effect that pretty soon, you know, it just rocks. <coughs> Yeah. And you just feel this and you're thinking, I've got six more songs yeah. in this concert. I, I, is, so, um, it's a mind game, isn't it? Exactly. That's, that's. Do you stop? Do you well, if you, start breathing quickly and not sing? I mean, how do you recover? Therapy? Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> how do you recover? So when you're in that, I, I, it's this. I would just say the same thing. You're asking me that question, I go back to breathing. Yeah. <laughs> because it's relax. I think you're getting tight. If you're talking about getting tight, it's if you have to, I mean, if you have to cut out for two measures and just say, relax and take a breath, do it. That's what I would say. I mean, choral singing is hard because um, it can be very tiring. And, um, and that things happened to me plenty of times. But I know that what happened for me when I'm singing in a, a chorus and that's starting to happen, I stop for a measure or two and let everything relax. And then I'm fine. You stop the vocal sound. I stop vocal. singing. Do you stop the movement? You don't mark? I pretend I sing, yes. Okay, so you're still pretend, So you look like I'm engaged. <laughs> you're engaged okay. I'm engaged. I do the Beyonce thing. Yeah. Right? <laughs> And then, <laughs> and, and then, then really sing. Okay. But I think that's a that's a good question because you can really, it, it, it gets very tired. Yeah, and it, it just keeps compounding. Has it ever happened to? I mean, it's happened to you obviously. But have you ever tried just stop singing and then getting back into it? Does that help? Uh, generally, it does. Most of the time is when you're putting on a concert, like you said, of about ten pieces, and I'm thinking about the Moravian festival right. and stuff where you're. You're going to be working so hard at, at this music right. that, um, yes, it's happened, but then, you know, after you finish the piece, then generally we would sit You got down some time to relax. Have, yeah, yeah, sometimes you wouldn't be back to back. You'd right. Maybe sit for two minutes before you got back up yeah. and started singing again. But I was just thinking how, if there was a way, a mind game. Or I think it's a mind game. And for, yeah, I think it's, it's just don't feel bad about cutting out for a couple of measures and, and relaxing. Don't, don't, if you try to push, stop. Don't push, because you're going to hurt yourself. If you're practicing during the day and you find, oh, I just can't get this thing, stop. Don't reinforce the bad thing. And what you're talking about, don't, don't even try it. I mean, just relax. You'll, it'll come back. 
was talking to somebody about this today, Jonathan. Um, yes, who has lost his voice. He has sinus problems, and he's lost. His, he can't get his voice back. But I know this is true. Every time a singer gets sick and loses their voice, they think it's never going to come back again. <laughs> but it will come back. It'll come back. Um, just give it time, and I think it's just giving a little bit of time. Uh, that actually made me think of something else too. Is that um, sometimes in a chorus you f you can't hear yourself. Oftentimes, you can't hear yourself when you're singing, so you try to sing louder, and that's a trap. So um, knowing what your voice feels like when you sing, rather than what it sounds like, is good exercise as well. So even singing, this is a, something silly, just play the, around with this sometime. You could do a scale and plug your ears and sing and just feel what it feels like. I mean, oftentimes you'll go into a, if, uh, I don't know what this hall sounds like, but if I walked into a hall and I didn't know what it sounded like, sometimes it just, you don't get anything back, you don't, you don't know what it feels like, it's, it's really disconcerting. So there's a part of your singing that has to be done purely physically and not with your ear. And I've noticed this with the chorus that I work with too, is that sometimes you know, the, the bassist might not be getting a certain note and say, well, it feels like it's here in this part of your voice. So it doesn't feel higher, it feels lower. So, or it feels lower in your chest. So feeling where a note is, is sometimes is important when you're singing a chorus because if you try to out-sing someone, you're going to be in trouble. Yeah? I've been told by a, a voice instructor sometimes that you really can't lift your voice by trying to sing very high notes, but you can if you try to get too low in your range. Is there any hint to that? Mm, no. I think, I think you can really mess your voice up if you try to sing high. Yeah, so definitely. Straining, straining, period. And it, it, it does have to do, even in your middle voice, if you're straining and your throat is closed, you have to stop and let it open up. So don't, don't try to push through something. And pushing actually does happen when you're tightening up your throat. It's not loose and you're not on your breath. So you can keep coming to that. So that's, that, that's basically not true. You can really mess yourself up if you're not singing correctly high. You can sing high, but if you're pushing. We've all had that experience. Yes, it gets tight. and I mean, there is a, actually, everyone has a limit <laughs> you know, to how high they can sing. Men do, yeah, men do. That's a trap for, for men, too, that developing a falsetto is, um, it's, sometimes you get stuck in your falsetto, and that's, that's not a good thing. Never heard, well, we're talking about something else, making sure that your voice is consistent through your range. Um, and it has more to do with tenors than it does with baritones or basses. So. Are there exercises to, to expand your range? Like, like what yeah. Age limits are there mm -hmm. something, is there a way to counteract that? I think uh, those scale your exercises that we talked about. We do um, these fives. Or do five and nines? I do something called a nine, which is that's an exercise, it's just expanding it on both sides. So and you can go and then just up a half step, you know. So, so doing scales that way, stepwise, is going to help you. Pardon me. I would say I would say for men on ah, uh, yeah. I mean, you can change syllables, but as men get higher, e and uh, and broader vowels are really difficult. So ah, uh, the neutral vowel is the best one. It's important to learn how to find the position of different vowels, but ah, uh, for these kind of stretching out exercises, Tom, it, it, those kind of exercises are really good for expanding your range. And the more in shape you are. Um, the, the easier it will be to expand your range. 
or to find out what exactly is possible. I mean, there are limitations. And for you, you're a baritone. So I would say uh, maybe an F sharp would be the top, or an F at this point. And then however low you go, A, something like that, G, for a baritone. Any other questions? Yes. Well, breath helps. Just take, taking the time to take the breath when you're singing will calm you down. And if you allow it to relax you, that'll, that'll do it. Yes? I think uh, you're asking me. Uh, I, I actually have a, 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 a vaporizer in my room every night. Make sure that there's enough uh, that there's enough um, moisture in the air, and you know, I don't smoke. <laughs> you know, don't don't just do healthy, regular things. I think it's just um, I use saline if I need to. I fortunately I don't have a lot of those problems, so I don't have to. You have to be careful with antihistamines sometimes because that can mess your voice up. But just just regular you know, common sense health things. I I'm not a real big believer in you know going overboard with that. What about the sinus rinse? Like neti pots. Uh, I, some people like that. I mean. I know singers that swear by it. My daughter swears by it. I just. But did I hear you say you don't have a lot of those problems unless you use a vaporizer at night? And yeah, that's true. I sometimes. That's about it. I mean, I don't. I don't take uh, medication for problems with sinuses and knock on wood. You know, it's it's not a huge problem for me. I, drink a lot of water, hydrate. I think that's just, uh, you probably know about as much, as much about that as I do. <laughs> um, but it's just, to me, it's just sort of common sense stuff. That, and it does affect, because if you have drainage on your cords, that's another thing. They don't work. They don't work. You have to drink fluids. Not too much, but drink fluids. <coughs> that's what. That's the week before, not the hour before. That's, yeah, or the day of, yeah. Keep it, keep it moving. Mucinex is a great thing, too. So. Does that have to go into our common cord? Mucinex? No, it works on sinuses. It does? Yeah. Mm -hmm. For me. <laughs> yeah. Right. There's lots of conversations about mucus for singers, with singers. Lots of. <laughs> How do you bridge um, going from the, um, let's call the chest voice to the head voice, mm -hmm. the, the natural break? Mm -hmm. that, that's, that area is called uh, passaggio. Passaggio. Well, passaggio is just, is just the bridge or passageway from your chest voice to your head voice. And that is another four-year course. <laughs> uh, I think actually singing these scales do it for you because you have to go through registers. So if you sing it, uh, are you a soprano? Yes. So if you sing an E major scale, you're going to have one right around here, B, B flat, A, right. All sopranos have that. It's making sure that you don't try to force it. So there's my image that I use is almost like an hourglass. So when you're going, ah, like, ah, and then it opens up. It's really hard. So you have to be really relaxed through there. Just make sure it, you just kind of let it go. Keep your breath moving. 
Yeah, Bob? Uh, it depends. It's a little bit lower. It could be like A flat. Not, low, huh? Not the low one, okay. but the, the higher one. Yeah. Do you have, everybody's different. Everyone is different. Uh, tenors is around a E or an F. Basses sometimes can be like a G or an A flat. Baritones could be a B flat, B. Basses, I am notice around a G or a, uh, a flat A right in there. So it's like three or four notes. So massage you. Well, I think here's here's what we should do. At another day, we'll have a vocal technique seminar. A vocal technique that would be. I would love to do that. Maybe. May, yes, maybe even you know on a regular basis because actually I've been talking to some of my colleagues at School of the Arts of, of doing that in the community, just having regular vocal technique and open it up to choral people. So we could talk about you know really have a pedagogy once a month, something like that. Yeah. Right. Uh, in more or less individually. Yes. And critique it because I have no idea how to turn the valve that opens my sinuses. <laughs> yeah. That's what I was going to say. That's a, that's a four year course. Really, I, I, I really, it, it's, it's, it, can, it can get very complicated and, and very, very specific. And it, it can get better and better all the time. Um, there's an element of frustration in vocal technique because you're going to try it and you're going to go, this is not working. And then you try it again, and well, maybe it's working a little bit. And then you try it again, okay, now I kind of get it. And it's very much like, like really when you're talking about serious vocal technique, you're talking about the same way a really top-notch athlete is training for the Olympics. So you're talking about something that's really, really subtle. I mean, and when, when we're talking about working on passaggi, that's tough. So I remember listening to an interview with Pavarotti and people saying, oh, your technique's so great. You know, what do you find to, you know, talk about your technique? He said, I will never feel comfortable singing through my passaggio. I have to work on it every single time I sing. So for 99.99999% of the population, when they heard him sing that, sing through his passaggio, they would never notice it. Never, ever, ever. But he struggled through it all the time. But he had a technique that worked through it. But it took him his entire career to keep working on that. And if you ask any singer, any the top singers in the world about their vocal technique, they'll tell you, I'm having problems with this, and I'm having problems with this. And it's a constant thing. But I think we could address issues like passaggio, or we could address issues like uh, really working on breath because it's, and how breath is connected to your, the rest of your body. I mean, when I say breath, I think that's so broad, that's basically, what are you talking about? You know, okay, breath. But um, it has to do with resonance. It has to do with tension, it has to do with tongue position, and then how it interrelates to all of that. And that's a very um, fine and uh, minuscule process and very interesting. But we should do it. We'll, we'll do it. Good. Good. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Oh, thank you. I, I thought I was going to talk for a half an hour or something. <laughs>